Good afternoon and welcome to our latest webinar in uh, our series of um, financial management webinars. And this one, it, this is Ruth McCambridge from the Nonprofit Quarterly. I'm the editor in chief. And I have with me today Hilda Polanco, who's the founder and CEO of Fiscal Management Associates. Um, this is a webinar which, which we cooked up together in a way um, to answer some questions that I think I hear a lot from our readership, which is who makes what kinds of decisions um, financially in an organization and what do they need to do that with. The name of this webinar, as you can see, is Creating High-Functioning Nonprofits Who Should Have What Financial Information, and we are proud to be sponsored once again by AccuFund, which is what they are who allows you to come to these uh, webinars for free. AccuFund is nonprofit financial management specialist helping thousands of nonprofits improve their overall financial management. Their reporting capabilities and intuitive dashboards enable sound decision making and better strategic execution of your mission. I want to encourage you to think about that as we are um, moving along because uh, having a good dashboard actually is important in the in, in what it is that we'll be talking to you about today and Hilda can Hilda will speak to that I'll speak to that um, but it is actually extremely important um, during the webinar today we're going to ask you to please share what you're learning on social media using the hashtag um, that uh, the hashtag pound sign Hilda on finance um, and, you know, that's a good way for other people to know that we're doing this today and that they can find this as a resource later on our site. We'll also be leaving time for questions at the very end of this. So if you have one at any point during the presentation, please log it in the questions area on the hand side of your screen. And um, we will answer them in kind of the order of their importance. If we get eight questions on a particular topic um, and that hasn't been covered in the presentation, that would be the one that we would pick. Um, so uh, please don't ask us the question, will you uh, share this? the slides and the presentation <laughs> with us because we will. Um, we will we will send it to you immediately after the webinar along with a resource list. So with that said, um, welcome Hilda and I'm going to start with some basics but but hello Hilda. Hello Ruth. Okay. And I'm just thrilled to be doing this with Hilda. She's one of our go-to what we call our financial brain trust here. Um, so I, I want to start this, can we go to the next slide perhaps? Okay, I want to start this by talking a little bit about you know who the usual suspects are um, to get good financial information from a nonprofit and as you can see I've listed some of those here. These are the people who almost everybody knows at some point you need to be sharing the best possible financial information with them. Um, but there are many other people who could use that information to good stead for your organization and that's the, the basics of what it is that we're talking about today. In my mind, um, the, there are many more problems in nonprofits that flow from too few people understanding financial dynamics and being involved in in decisions that include um, financial information then flow from too many people knowing financial information unless you've got uh, got something seriously up inside of your organization. Those problems go well beyond catching instances of fraud and mismanagement. Uh, the a lack of understanding of one of a business model can be much more fatal and this is way too common even among boards and execs. Um, so very often, so you'll, you'll see, for instance, that um, we're talking about the executive committee, the finance committee, as separate from the entire board. And the fact of the matter is, in a lot of boards, and you may have one of these yourself, 
um, in a lot of boards, the whole board does not understand the financial dynamics of the organization, what it is that leverages other things, um, what you have to be careful about, what the important variables are. The, the, in a lot of boards, when you pass around the financials, people will look at them, but they won't be able to understand if this moves, what does that mean for the rest of the, of the scenario? Um, and, you know, financial statements are very often, they, they re will reflect these dynamics inside of organizations, but in the way we present them, they very often look flat and, um, it, it, you know, we can't get, it, we can't understand the dynamics enough to be able to really work with them. And that includes the usual suspects as well as people who might not be so usual. Can we go on to the next slide? Um, so, um, I, I do want to say before I go on to this that it, as in any kind of math, um, facility with numbers really depends on your conceptual understanding of their relationships. Um, and those can be much better described for a lot of people on a well constructed dashboard than in a series of financial statements. Um, so, you know, and, and we have to be able to translate things. The way we talk about things now is almost, it, it almost purposely obfuscates the reality. So, for instance, a badly framed, uh, a badly timed effort to build an endowment can rob you of all your fluidity in your cash situation and that can be deadly <laughs> but we don't describe we when people talk about endowments they t often talk about them as if aha we finally achieved what you know some measure of maturity but in fact it could be the exact wrong move for an organization that may run into tough times unless you've got a lot of other working capital at hand so, um, so wh what I'm basically saying is that it's very important for us to make financial information understandable. And there are any number of ways for, for us to do that, um, it, uh, particularly using dashboards. And I'm going to, we'll leave questions about what a dashboard is for later. Okay. Um, so that said, I want to... Uh, this, this is about the tracking systems. Do they have meaning? And then we're going to go on to the next slide, which really uh, talks about what our assumptions about organizations are. Can we go on to the next one really quickly? Okay. So this is the default organizational form, which is hierarchical, and um, m many organizations have already begun to make some changes on this very basic form. But this default form has one leader at the top, probably, uh, you know, in some ways surrounded by a board, some middle managers, and then a lot of people on the front lines. Those people on the front lines have a lot of information, but if the assumption is that 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 person at the top is the gatherer of all information, then you may not be, be gathering kind of the insights of the people at the bottom. This is a very outdated model. Um, so let's go on to the next one. This is more the, the model of organization in the information era and really because um, each person doing work on the front lines of the organization or anywhere in the organization is going to pick up a certain amount of information. They may be finding out that another clinic is starting down the road from your clinic and, and in fact is on a more well-traveled street than yours. Um, they may know that before other people know that. Um, and so you want to know what it is that's going on around you from as many people as possible who understand what might affect your finances and your financial dynamics. The information era then requires that those people on the parameter of the organization are actually able, when they see something occurring in the work and in and around the work of the organization, that they're able to just quickly say, look, this needs to go into the general mix of stuff at the center that we need to pay attention to. 
Um, and then, you know, as a as a group or as a as a leadership committee, people make decisions on the basis of the widest source of information as possible. But if those people at the edges of the organization don't know what's going to be important to the financial sustainability of the organization, they have less facility to actually help. Um, the organization to make the best kinds of decisions. So that's just a really quick um, discussion of what the difference is between uh, uh, industrial age organization, information age organization. Um, the information age organization is much more fluid in the way that it discusses um, situations and is much more agile in rapidly changing conditions, which we can all certainly anticipate will happen. Okay, really quickly on to the next one. The other thing that really affects the way we think about who should have what information is just what stage of development our nonprofits are in. Um, so very traditionally, um, there are I've 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 noted three stages of development here, and um, they're they're the ones that I think are most important to most people. But I'm just going to go through them really quickly. In an, in the informal kind of the beginning stages of development, um, what happens is that whoever has facility with numbers basically is included in financial decision making. So you kind of elect the people to uh, at the board level that you uh, to treasure that you think are able to work well with um, whoever it is that's making decisions at the staff level. But this is often very informal, more group um, organized than, than not. Um, but it often also doesn't have systems that are there to really support it properly. So you'll very often in the first stage of development have mistakes being made purely out of ignorance. The second stage, which is a directive stage, is a response to the first stage. And that's when people, you know, the, the leadership of the organization grabs everything and says, oh, this is too out of control. We're going to, we're going to run, you know, we're going to drive everything from the top. Uh, we need to get this under control. And as soon as the organization begins to get any sense of scale, it goes to this more you know, delegative um, system where you have people at various, you know, heading up various units in the organization who actually need to be involved in developing the budget, etc. Um, so uh, very often what stage of development you're in will drive who you think needs to know. Um, financial information for the organization. The reason why I wanted to lay this groundwork is that, that um, these cultures that flow from your stage of development and from your assumptions about organizational form can very often blind you to the full set of options in front of you. So with that, I want to um, hand this over to Hilda, who is the real expert here. Hilda? Thank you, Ruth. Thanks for that um, introduction. Let me uh, get to the, the uh, next phase of our presentation. Um, we um, here at FMA and the work that we do with organizations have seen that um, there's a couple of things we see over and over again. And one is that a plan without any numbers is a really good a set of ideas um, and by that I'm speaking of strategic plans and plans in general and um, in addition um, there's the saying that we all recognize which is what gets measured gets done and so when you think about both of those things we we want to um, discuss for the rest of the webinar how we can think about number uh, analysis tracking metrics how are those um, amazing tools to help us identify where it is we want to go and what it is we want to, um, to measure to get there. When we think about strategic planning and the goals of an organization, which by the way involve everyone at the organization in some level, but for certainly uh, the senior leadership, the strategies typically come out of plans and they specify what an organization hopes to achieve, what the goals are, 
And oftentimes we see strategic plans that end right there. What are our goals for the year? What are our priorities? And um, there's a few more levels that we think are important with respect to the role that finances play. So if we have a strategic plan and we've identified our actions and goals, the next question that we all need to ask is how are we going to reach those goals? And um, the how question often goes into the operational decisions. How many staff, what locations, and that translates to this last question of how much? How is the resource allocation going to happen? So from the very, very early stages of planning, the idea of the how and how much becomes really critical to the chair of the board, to the CEO, and to the program director that's running the program every day. So if we think from the very, very high level, we want um, our leadership at the line, line management level all the way to executive level to be thinking of numbers not so much in a compliance sense, we think of audits and 990s, but more from a strategy and execution. What do we need to know to get to where we want to be? And um, with respect to boards, uh, Ruth, you were talking about uh, executive committee and boards in general, There's, there tends to be sometimes a framework of compliance. And what we hope to accomplish in our time together is help you shift from this framework of compliance all the way around. We don't want program directors to only think of finance when it comes to the receipts or the audit from the funder, but more from the tool that's going to get us to be where we want to be. And I know that many of us um, right now are in some sort of reflective moment, thinking about our operations, what will changes in the future mean to us. And if we want to have a framework for long-term sustainability and long-term analysis of our model, there's a few things that we think are really important that I'm going to share. And I want you to think about, as I'm going through these, how do we currently involve our leadership team at all levels in these kinds of plans? Um, certainly at the board level, but how else do we involve our teams in these decisions? First and foremost, I think the one thing that um, I've seen a lot more this year, and I'm hoping to see more in years to come, is this idea that financial models, planning, budgets, they're not a one-year discussion. They really are at least a two-year calculation. And while today we may feel like we can only look a quarter into the future, for the long term of the organization, we really want to think of the financial goals that we're setting for ourselves um, annually as well as in the long term. And some of those goals um, focus on very specific things, such as the operating reserves. Does our leadership team understand what our strategy is for reserves and the policies for their use? We may be needing reserves in the near term. How much do we have? Why are they there? How liquid are they? Do we all understand the full cost of programming? I think that um, we oftentimes celebrate new revenue uh, in equal ways, whether it's a government contract or a private fundraising effort. Um, and there are some grants, particularly government, but others as well, where the full costs aren't covered by the grant. And so when we celebrate a new grant, we actually need to also be acknowledging, does that cover the full cost, or are we actually committing to raise additional funds to go with that grant. Are we incorporating scenario uh, planning? I think more than ever now we don't know the certainty of the future with respect to revenues and with respect to activities. So when we think about our future we want to think about it from a plan A, plan B. What are the different assumptions in those plans and how can we create a culture where our, our line management, our, our program leaders, feel like they are a part of these scenarios. I'll share some ideas with you on that. But how can we build a culture of scenario planning, what if, um, as just a matter of, of course? In, in addition to the sort of operating things I'd mentioned, um, there's always the question of the planning for the capital needs, both from a, a fixed asset investment as well as working capital. How much cash do we have at a certain time? What's it available for? Can we defer long-term investments uh, if we need the cash for something else? And then lastly, as I mentioned, um, this idea of multi-year plan. So if we're thinking at a leadership level, 
what information do we need to know and who needs to know it, um, we want to keep in mind these very high level strategic questions that are going to shape the choices that we make. That's the first item, creating these goals and plans. The second item for us to think about is having the mechanisms to monitor those plans. And planning and monitoring, as you'll see in a minute, are the processes that we believe really bring leadership teams together. The, from the development to the program to finance to human resources, the planning for our future and the monitoring of it is a team approach. There is no other way around it. Um, using uh, Ruth's terms of um, the information age, we, we live in a world where um, the, the, the sharing of that leadership is absolutely critical. The performance indicators, when I talk about dashboards, and you may have attended some of our other webinars where we've dug really deeply into, into the dashboard conversation, the performance indicators are really what bring, bring everyone together around what's important for the organization in each of the corners of, of, the, of, the, of the organization. The dashboards help you track those performance indicators. And lastly, from a mechanism perspective, we believe that forecasting the future results for a year is an extremely valuable tool where each leader in the organization has an opportunity to learn from the past and predict the future. We often spend quite a bit of time looking at budget to actual results, but in fact, that's looking in the rear view mirror, that's thinking about the past. We want to put our teams in a position of um, trying to have a sense of, of control or a sense of framing for what's to come based on what they've learned. So forecasting is a really important part, and I'll come back to what does that look like um, in an organization. We over the years have developed this model that we call the strategic financial management model and um, we believe it, it has four components and one is planning, the second is monitoring, the third is operations, the finance operations with respect to who we have on the team, the technology behind it, the processes, and then we have the board and the board overseeing all of this. The planning and monitoring as you can see it's a, it's a cycle, the arrow dictates that this is not a one-time exercise, we do this throughout the year and having the right people at the right place in the right conversations can really make a difference in terms of the ability to deliver on mission and to manage the resources that, that are behind that. And as Ruth was talking about the teams um, that are involved in, in coming up with these decisions, um, this, this way of thinking that we have here kind of reminds us that financial management is shared and it's not the role of the CFO alone. Um, we might actually add another angle here if we had a director of human resources at the table or a director of risk management in larger organizations. But these are the three critical perspectives of an organization's operations, the financial, the program perspective, and the development. And when we're having different conversations, each one brings an element of knowledge, an element of um, expertise to the table, any one of these parts of the triangle alone cannot execute financial management. Together we have the full perspective and on the development side they are in a position to, to know what contributions uh, were requested for what purpose, what restrictions came with them. The development team uh, manages and maintains that relationship with the funding source so that perspective needs to be at the table. I think if there's an area for team improvement, it's in that strengthening of the relationship between the dollars raised and the management of those dollars. So we've got our development perspective and they're at the table. We have the program perspective. They know what programs can be run or, and what programs can't be. Um, they're in a position to bring to the table, are we executing on our programs the way we thought? Are we able to meet the requirements of the funders? Can we do that program that the funder expects us to do? Um, can I deliver with the level of vacancies that I have on my team right now? It's all about the delivery of what it is we're doing. And then of course on the finance side, um, we have the financial information that tells the financial story. Finance is in a sort of record keeping reporting role and it's also in a planning and um, forecasting role. At the table, 
um, finance is really bringing the data that hopefully uh, consistently tells the story that development is experiencing and that program is experiencing. And together we have our executive team and the team as a whole sets the direction for the organization obviously in collaboration with the board. So as you can see, um, we often think of this process as team decision making, TDM. And team decision making means we each bring our perspective. Um, uh, for example, on a quarterly basis, if you have uh, significant levels of restricted foundation funding, we can only really know whether we are satisfying the restrictions and properly delivering on those grants if we have all of these perspectives around the table. And so I'll talk later about meeting structures and how you can have each of these folks bring their perspective to the financial conversation around where we are and, and where we're heading and what challenges might we bring. But I want you to keep this team decision making framework. And again, when you think of your operations, um, you might want to think about, am I creating a culture where the team is getting to decisions in a way that they understand how we got there? and also in a way that they feel like they're bringing their expertise. There's often this question of who's responsible for what when it comes to the financial management. I wanted to share with you this, this process, right? The way that dollars flow in the financial tracking systems of an organization. And um, purchases, for example, if we can have a theoretical purchase of a, um, of a piece of computer equipment, um, it very much starts with the very beginning. Someone is documenting the expenditure. Someone is thinking about, do we need it? What do we need it by? And that someone is usually um, in the field, in the actual um, delivery part of the program, unless it's something specific to the back office of, of finance, uh, finance or development. Typically, it's out there. We're delivering services, and we are um, making a purchase. That person needs to be empowered to know where are we in those budgets and do I have enough money in my budget to spend this. And there's a process in this very early stage that when I mention it, some of you might cringe and it's this idea of coding, right? Who is responsible in an organization to determine what budget category should be charged for this expenditure? Um, the people who are making the purchase and are allocating those resources should be in the best position to know whether they can or not. Do they have the available resources? As it goes up the line, of course, that's authorized by the manager of whoever is purchasing these items. And that requires a knowledge of how are we doing against our budget? Can we afford to make this purchase after all? And those functions are in the initial stages of the, of the purchasing. The hiring of consultants is a, is a significant transaction. The hiring of personnel, all of that sits outside the finance function, in the actual running of the business. Then we have the later two stages, which is how do we record all of this? Should these expenses be allocated? What funder should pay for it? The recording of that activity typically happens in the finance office based on very clear instructions of what's come in from those budget managers. So in the sharing of the responsibility, the finance function is recording that activity and reporting it back to the users. So finance has a heavy role in this stage in the center, which is quality data, timely reporting in, an, in a format that is meaningful and usable by the team. And then we get to this last stage of financial management, which I mentioned earlier was, was monitoring. Are we in budget? Are we not? What are the action plans that we need in order to be back on budget or in order to um, raise additional funds? That conversation of monitoring cannot be done inside the finance office and cannot be done in isolation in a department unit. That is a joint responsibility. So based on what I've sort of walked you through here, um, I, want, I want you to sort of envision how these processes happen in your organization. Some of the friction that I think exists and, and why some non-financial people come to finance with a bit of anxiety, a bit of um, how can I ever get through this conversation, 
um, it's sometimes caused by a lack of understanding of roles and by a series of examples where something is coded to one code, the finance office changes it because they realize it didn't belong there, but no one ever goes back to let that original person know, gee, we've made this change and this is why. So this is all a very supportive process and one of education. Finance educating program around what these reports mean and why they are laid out the way they are and program and development educating finance about what's happening uh, in, in the running of the organization that's being reflected in these numbers. So from the department heads to the finance office to a shared responsibility, that's really how these numbers flow and at every stage department heads need information, finance needs information, department heads development being one of them needs certain data in order to make those decisions. So give some thought to how that information flows in the way you manage information and, um, and, and think about how that could be created as a culture. One of the most important aspects of this is the monitoring, right? That's where we're going to redirect if we need to. That's where we're going to need to change course or stay the course if we're on the right track. And um, we believe a very critical aspect of doing this is this idea of decision-making meetings. You can call them anything you'd like. The, the more exciting the name, the better. These are these periodic meetings where um, the team gets together, the team being, again, everyone I've mentioned to date, and we're talking about where are we. Um, the calendar, specific dates, times, topics, it is dedicated to financial action steps, um, changes in course, what decisions do we need to make based on where we are. And um, although there may be one-on-one -on -one meetings with specific department heads, this is the opportunity for the team as a whole to understand how we are doing holistically for the organization. It requires having the data and the reports before the meeting. We often see lots and lots of effort going into reports that are generated and they are emailed to the ultimate recipients with a note, give me a call if you have any questions. Well that may not necessarily get you what you need in terms of the decision making. A structured meeting with the information in advance and then lastly some type of action steps uh, summarized. I'm not going as far as to say meeting notes or minutes or anything like that but notes is actually a good word. What, what did we agree to do? So that when you're meeting next time, you go back to what did we agree? Were we going to try and modify a budget? Were we going back to a funder? What were those critical action steps that together we decided needed to be done? Those meetings, um, every other month, every quarter, wherever you feel um, that's reasonable to, to carry out, doesn't have to be a whole day, an hour, hour and a half. You can get to the organization's leadership understanding where the risks are and where we need to be thinking. The topics that might be covered, how are we doing budget to actual overall and for particular programs? Are we meeting our contracts um, in the way that they are laid out right now? Um, might we have to have some um, strategies around cost controls? Uh, did we just receive a new grant where we need to do some significant hiring? Um, are we meeting the restricted grants? And then lastly, what I mentioned earlier, this idea of forecasting. The energy that goes into solving the puzzle of we're here, we were supposed to be somewhere else. Now that we know where we are, how can we redirect? That last bullet point, forecasting the future, is, um, is really, really critical and, and uh, the website that we often refer to, Strong Nonprofits, which I'll mention at the end, there is a newly added tool to help organizations forecast results in the future. And the more that you have non-financial people involved in the forecasting, the more likely it is that that forecasting will be on the mark and, and, uh, and accurate and owned by those who are going to ultimately execute for the rest of the of the year. As far as the reports themselves, um, this is certainly a function of the financial systems that are in place. What kinds of reports um, are, are, are designed? Uh, it's an answer that's based on the design of the system. I will show you in a little bit what we think is a good 
cheat sheet of reports and who should get which ones. But in theory, um, all of these reports should really address the needs of the, of the team. They should be designed in a way that program managers are getting financial information about the programs that they are responsible for. Sometimes a program manager is responsible for more than one program. Other cases, it's, it's um, one program at a time. So who needs to know that information? Is it at the board level or is it at, at some other level? They should be user friendly. And as you might imagine, user friendly is in the eye of the beholder. Um, the idea being, how can we make these reports as, as approachable, as understandable as possible um, by everyone, including those who feel comfortable with finance and those who may feel less comfortable. They should be reviewed and discussed, back to my comment on the meetings. A report that gets emailed and never discussed is likely to go um, unread or not reviewed as much as we need to if we're going to have a report that's used to make decision make uh, decisions. So we want these reports to, to be timely, available, user-friendly, and and one thing I wanted to use as an example of what, so what is user-friendly after all? Um, something we've seen be very, very helpful with uh, non-financial leaders is this idea of taking our budget and dividing the costs that managers are responsible for into two types, um, controllable costs and non-controllable costs together both of these comprise the total cost of running the program. The controllable costs are those costs that a program manager has, as easy as that sounds, has control over. And the non-controllable are costs that are fixed. They are um, part of the program. They are shared costs with other programs. But the program manager needs to know about those costs. But there isn't much they could really do to affect the outcome. So if I'm a program manager and I receive a report that gives me 27 lines of data, budget to actual, and I can control about seven of those, it's painstaking for me to go through that report and figure out which are the lines that I'm responsible for so that I can then see what I can actually do to control if that's what I need to do, control the costs. If there was a way to design the report, and I'll share a picture in a minute, where the, the program manager gets to see all of the controllable costs in one group and the non-controllable in another. The non-controllable is more for your information. The controllable is for your action. And if you um, go through an exercise, and I encourage you to do this, and ask yourself, what are the items in my budget that a program manager is totally in control of or significantly in control of? Um, certainly salaries, depending on the structure of the organization, salaries for program positions may or may not be in the control of the manager. Um, so that's a possibility, and that of course goes with benefits. But then as you go through, you might find travel, supplies, marketing, certain things depending on your business model, and I assure you that they will not be more than nine or ten items, if that many. And then there are all these other items like overhead and insurance and all these rent, all these other things that the program manager really doesn't have much control. By running the report and saying, here's your budget to actual, here are your controllable costs, and this is just a theoretical example, you can see the top section of this budget to actual is all together with the controllable costs, and then the non-controllable at the bottom. I, as the program manager, will hopefully look at the entire report, but I am going to have laser focus on these 10 items that are un in my control. I can focus on this much more. I can um, specifically have the assumptions that were made when we built these controllable cost assumptions, and it, gives, it allows me a focused perspective on what I should be looking at and what changes I need to make. And so this, this is just one example of how to take the idea of a report and then go through this concept of user-friendly. For us, this is one example of how a report could be user-friendly. In terms of what reports should be received and by who and how often, we believe department managers should receive budget to actual on the revenue and the expenses by programs, by grants, if they have restricted contracts and grants. 
And there should be a performance dashboard unique to that department. And in our dashboards webinar, you could um, hear more about what are some typical indicators in development or indicators in finance or program. So those department leaders really need to know for themselves which are the critical drivers, which are those KPIs, the key performance indicators that I need to look out for. And I'll, I'll talk about a few examples in a minute. If I am the leadership team, executive director or in larger organizations, the chief program officer, chief development officer, and in smaller organizations, the department manager and executive leadership might be one and the same, but this idea that on a monthly basis, the leadership team is looking at the organization holistically with details on a program level. It's important to know which programs are doing well and which programs are being challenged, but organizationally, how are we doing? And you can see that the list of reports here is a pretty standard list of budget to actual, the statement of activities, which means how did we do that month. Um, the, set, the budget to actual shows how we did against budget, what's our balance sheet, and uh, what are some of the supporting schedules for that, receivables, payables, restricted funds. Cash flow projection, how um, uh, for some organizations this is less critical, for other organizations it's the most important report with respect to challenges the organization may be facing. And then lastly, and, and this doesn't necessarily start immediately at the beginning of the fiscal year, but certainly after the first six months where you have some history and data for the year, what else do we need to think about to forecast the rest of the year? And that year in forecast, particularly in the last four months of a fiscal year, really become the tool by which we're keeping an eye on how do we think we're going to end the year. And that is the we, the development, the finance, the program. This is not an isolated activity in the finance office. This is where we come together to see that we all need that information. And of course, the top item there was performance dashboards. That's when the dashboard goes a little bit higher to the executive level and we're not only as one program director looking at the detailed dashboard for that department, but we're building a dashboard at this level that's more organizational. And then lastly, and I'm suggesting quarterly, some of you I know have, may have board meetings more often, but on a quarterly basis um, there should be a financial uh, review. And that set of reports looks awfully similar to the leadership reports. They will probably be in a bit more summary level than you might give to the leadership team. But there is this other item called the management narrative. And the management narrative allows management to tell the board what are the issues that are top of mind, what's the financial information that's maybe of concern to the leadership, and really is an opportunity to ask the board how they can be helpful, how can they um, uh, come to, uh, to the meeting of the minds with leadership on what issues need to be addressed. So all of these reports have a purpose, a different readership at a different time with a different cycle, and in their design should be um, done in a way that addresses the needs of those individual stakeholders that I've mentioned. And there is uh, a combination of software packages here, anything that's about the past. Um, we're talking about your accounting software being able to generate these reports. Anything that's about the future, like cash flow projections and forecasts, that's usually an Excel-based tool. And as you move into performance dashboards, that could be Excel, it could be um, uh, some specific software uh, developed for the purpose of dashboards. And each of these um, as Ruth said early on, it's having the right tool that's going to help you make this um, just a routine process and not um, a day-long project overwhelming to the team that's trying to accomplish it. I did want to end the conversation around reports with the issue of the dashboards and, and Ruth alluded to it and we, as you could tell from the work that we do, um, we believe dashboards are really critical. We, we live in a world of data lots of data, information overload, and the tool of a dashboard, whether it's comprehensive or, or, or more straight and to the point, the, the dashboard is a tool that supplements uh, what you already have. So when we looked at the board package, um, we said there was a narrative, there was a balance sheet, a budget to actual, a year in projection, cash flow, 
and then there's the dashboard. And for those board members that feel really comfortable with the first set, they might be able to read these and come up with what the, um, what the signs of, of risk are, but the performance dashboard is really where that comes to life. And um, just using this as an example, um, this is no better or worse than any other examples that may be out there, but I chose this example because I think you can see that this dashboard is a combination of operating results, um, composition of revenue, scholarship data, which is about the participants in the program. This is a multi-service um, organization that has an early childhood program. So this is specific to that program. We might see a dashboard one level up that is for all programs that would be at the board level. This particular one is for this particular program and would be for the leadership of that program and perhaps for, for the board if they were interested in this detail for one program at a time. It has performance data around enrollment, you can see at the bottom of it. And so these are all um, based on KPIs, key performance indicators that were identified to be the critical drivers of information. KPIs that are performance-based are set because they, they are the ones that ultimately represent performance of the mission of the organization or the services that we're delivering. And so there's always going to be some link between programmatic activity performance and financial outcomes um, ultimately. So in setting these KPIs and in setting this information, um, it comes to life for the non-financial reader how this information ultimately connects. In the case of enrollment, that will actually have a, a connection to revenue or, um, or uh, not making certain uh, contract goals, etc. So um, this sort of wraps up the, um, the portion of the webinar on information sharing. Uh, we do have time for questions, and I know that Ruth has been working on gathering those questions. Before I turn to questions, I, I just again want to give you um, some closing thoughts. We have some resources at the end of the webinar as well for you to refer to. Um, but hopefully what we covered today will give you some ideas as to how you might start, if you're not there yet, or reinforce the engagement of your multi-area uh, leaders into this question of financial uh, planning and financial monitoring, and um, give them a place at the table to feel comfortable, uh, to feel like they can ask the questions, and to feel that whether they agree or not in the ultimate decision that's been made, that they understand the process of how you as an organization got there so that they can stand behind the, the ultimate decisions that you as a team um, do make. So Ruth, I'm turning it back to you for any questions that you might have received during the, during the webinar. Okay, and um, I think what I want to do is to just uh, claim uh, the facilitator's right in this because a couple of the questions are, um, are interesting to me and I think I can answer to some extent. Um, the, the ability to sustain financially does not only have to do with your financial circumstances. It very much has to do with other characteristics of your organization. So I got one question that asked, are we considering at all the results of the presidential election in the way that we're presenting this webinar? And another uh, that asked for any particular war stories that could illuminate um, what it, how people need to think about where decisions get made at this point. And here's what I would have to say about that. First of all, we've been tracking very carefully uh, who, what appointments are being are being made um, for the president elect's cabinet, and um, it's not in every case extremely exciting for us. <laughs> so um, it is exciting. It's uh, thrills and it's spills. Um, not not necessarily a stable scene, and so it's virtually impossible at this point, though, to to predict what will happen um, in various agencies and funding sources. But I'm going to just bring up a particular situation that I was involved in being very old when Reagan was elected. Among other things, 
he completely dismantled an agency that um, funded 95% of the funding that the org of the organization that I was involved with, which was a battered women's organization. Um, and the board was made up of, of completely of um, people who were volunteering at the shelter. If you volunteered at the shelter for four months, you were on the board automatically. And you wouldn't necessarily think, well, this is the best chosen board to get through a financial crisis, but it was the exactly right uh, best chosen board to get through the financial crisis. Uh, once we understood that, in fact, we had been over-reliant, terribly over-reliant on one source and therefore were very vulnerable, we had three months to put together a plan to uh, transfer that reliance onto more local sources. That was terrifying. But the people who took that on were actually not used to being financial decision makers, but were used to being active advocates for the organization. And we somehow managed to get that organization um, completely, its, its dependence completely transitioned um, to local sources over those three months. Um, but it took a lot of organizing and political activity in one thing and another. The point I'm trying to make is that if people do understand the dynamics of the organization, um, it may be that they can see other ways of approaching a particular situation that wouldn't be necessarily in the minds of financial decision makers. And this is a very important point, that the more intelligence you have, informed intelligence you have inside of the organization to move what needs to be moved, um, the more wisely you can approach a situation in which there is essentially a disaster in the making. Um, originally, the decision made by uh, the, the finance committee of the board was to close the shelter. Um, and they all actually felt so strongly about that that they resigned when we said no, when the other volunteers said no. And we did manage to bring it through just through sheer kind of political will and a, a widespread base. So what, what I do want to say is that these, these kinds of things, when you're thinking about who to share financial information with, among other things, you have to think about how do we communicate risk? How do we communicate what our, what our most essential formulas are for the sustainability of our organization? And then how do we make sure that people understand what they can do to actually make that whole, sometimes very complicated, dynamic work? And that takes a, a lot of education. So I want to hand it now over to, I, that's, I, that is my war story and what might we be, um, what, what might be we be facing with this new presidency all in one. I do feel like some of the people coming in um, to the cabinet look scary um, to certain funding sources and you should be watching our post-election -co coverage for that. Um, because some of it's going to be relatively unpredictable and has the potential for being quite disastrous for certain fields. Given that, um, I want to just hand this back to Hilda to answer a question that was posed, Hilda, by someone who said, I keep trying to, be, to share information with people and I'm facing a, a numbers fear. Um, that people are so scared of the numbers that, I, you know, they, they can't be drawn into a focus on how to work with them. So could you talk a little bit about what the responsibility is of leadership when either on their board or on their staff or among stakeholders, people truly do not understand what the numbers mean? Okay. Um... I think there are a few levels of responsibility here and I hope that if I don't have CEOs on the call that um, this could be shared uh, with them. The CEOs often uh, set the stage uh, 
lead by example and so creating a culture where numbers are embraced starts at the very top and it starts it starts from a, a pot, from a, from the beginning and so if i as a as a non-financial person have never been involved in the planning process don't understand how the numbers come together um, were not was not involved in prioritizing my experience with numbers is usually at the end when it's a bit of a why didn't this work out and there's a, a little bit of, of guilt and, and, and um, feeling of uh, I didn't perform well and that's only half the story the monitoring that I, I, I mentioned is at the end so in order for people to, to feel more comfortable with numbers they need to be involved from the very beginning in how it comes together um, there are tools to help folks um, slowly correlate program activities to budgets. I think on the finance side, and I myself am a financial uh, professional by background, um, we don't often think of ourselves as educating in the role. We think of ourselves as um, analysis and planning and, and, um, and understanding the model but we are actually the financial team members are educators for the rest of the organization and so I would hope that the finance folks would take an extra step to sit down with the non-financial um, team members and explain how it comes together walk them through the original plan because that's typically connected to program goals and then walk them through how that happens um, from the beginning to the month end to the quarter to the end of the year. I also find that um, when leaders, for example, uh, after a board meeting come back and either have an all staff meeting or have meetings with department heads and talk about the budget that was just approved by the board, what was challenging, um, where did the board have um, uh, a sort of a near miss on, on approving the budget. The more that people are informed about the issues, the more the numbers will just be just a reporting mechanism. But if the fear is there, I, I, I think it's partly caused by just a lack of understanding how, how it was built all along. And I'll just close by saying that having said all that, the planning uh, process is the opportunity to educate and the planning process is not just at the beginning, but in every single quarterly review there's a planning for the rest of the year and if we take planning as education that might be helpful uh, in order to help those folks and as I mentioned the dashboards and just trying to narrow it down to what are absolutely the critical factors and once someone feels comfortable with that they can be ready to take on more okay so uh, those were a few questions but <laughs> there are many more and I want to I want to um, just reassure those who came to this webinar that we'll be running a series of additional webinars and some of the other questions that we got today really had to do with um, what kinds of forecasting tools are there how do we do scenario planning when there's still so much in question um, and then uh, always critically important in these kinds of times is to make sure that you know how to do cash flow projections um, because when money gets tight unexpectedly those cash flow projections are extremely important and so we will be running web uh, webinars on all of these topics over the next you know next few months and if you have any additional suggestions about things that you need from us we are very, very happy to hear from you about what you what what those are. So I want to say thank you so much to you, Hilda. I think this was hugely important and um, illuminating. And thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, let me just quickly point to those folks um, on the webinar, the resources. And again, you you will have a copy of this. I referred to the webinar and the article previously on dashboards. There is an article I encourage you to read. It's a bridge span article, how to talk about finances so non-financial folks will listen. Rarely well done um, and I think um, you'll enjoy it. The other webinar we did earlier on financial reporting. Um, this is the website I mentioned, strongnonprofits.org. On January 24th we'll have a, 
a 60-minute uh, tour of the site. On that site, there is a magnificent cash flow um, projection tool as well as a forecasting tool. And so if you go on the 24th of January, you'll hear all about it. Um, and you can visit the site and just go under the planning section and look for those tools that specifically addressed um, two of the items. There's also a scenario planning tool in there. Um, so we'll do more, but this is a quick way to answer some of those questions that were asked. Back to you. So thank you very much, Hilda, and thank you again to AccuFund for uh, funding this webinar so that all of you could attend free. Please remember, all of you who came and who appreciated this information, we need your donations as we uh, creep up on the end of the year. Um, NPQ is cheap to you and very expensive to run. So uh, make sure that you help us with um, ensuring that we get through our own um, our own needs 